Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to go dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was laying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel had not yet known the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived the Lord was speaking to the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, 
go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys in my residence places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my life span would be to be like yours. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater th things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I know that a lot of you know that one of my favorite things to preach about uh, is, uh, I would file under the uh, title of things that are not in the Bible. I've, I've preached a sermon like that once before. I love those. There are all kinds of things that we hear uh, all the time that are attributed to God or to the scriptures that, that just are not there ever anywhere. People pin some really bad theology on God. God helps those who help themselves, right? That's one of my favorites. It's not in there, nowhere. You, I, I, it's, you're just not going to find it. It is not in there. God will never give you more than you can handle. That was not in there either. A lot of people think that's in there. Now, it does say that God will never allow you to be tempted uh, more than you can bear, but that's that's different. That's not the same. That's not the same thing. God is not the one who afflicts us. We know that. C.S. Lewis said that there would be no point in God sending you a trial to test you because he knows what the outcome would be already, right? We, we have failed that test all, already, every, every one of us. The world is not the way that he wanted it to be, and one day he will come to set it aright. Now, I used to wonder how these things happen. How does God get misquoted and pinned with things that are just not true? But then I turn on the radio or the television and I say, ah, that's how that happens. Uh, it happens all the time. And speaking of Joel Osteen, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a while since I picked on Pastor Osteen, but I'm in the mood today. Now, I. I am not making a judgment of his character or his morality or his goodness. Ad hominem attack is something that Christians have got to stop doing. Uh, it's making for a very ugly world. But the message that is preached by Lakewood Church, now that's fair game, right? So that's, that's what I'm talking about today. That message that, that, uh, that has been honed and refined by Joel Osteen for the last 22 years has, has basically abandoned Christian theology and it has become huge and influential. And I will admit to you, it is quite pleasant to listen to, isn't it? It's kind and it's gentle. It isn't offensive to any one group of people. Uh, Rick Perry and John McCain have worshiped there and Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama have worshiped there. It's, it's just comfortable for everybody. The church had 5,000 in attendance when, uh, when he was called to be the senior pastor. And he smiled and he preached his way to an average Sunday attendance of 43,000 people. Average Sunday attendance. They have a thousand children in their nursery every single Sunday. So, so why do I rib at him so often? He's clearly doing something right. I, I just can't argue with that. He has grown an already huge church tenfold in the last 20 years. The only beef that I have with it is it is not really Christianity. Not, not really. It's a temple of the power of positive thinking. You can do it. You, all by yourself. And when you do it, which is apparently 
living your best life, whatever that means. God will shower you with blessings. Blessings which come not only in the form of happiness and contentment, but also in the form of things, of health and wealth and comfort. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with preaching that? Is it really so bad? It makes people happy. It makes people feel good. And if you can leave people feeling good on Sunday mornings, they will show up in droves, thousands upon thousands of them. Don't I want people to feel good? I do. I really, really do. But we have to be honest with ourselves that that is not the promise of Christianity. It's not. It never has been. In fact, for centuries and centuries, Christianity has been the thing that will make sense of a world that is full of pain and sickness and tragedy. Only Christianity can make sense of that for me. Now, there's a story about, that's attributed to St. Teresa. Whether it's true or not is debatable, but St. Teresa, the Spanish uh, St. Teresa, Teresa of Avila, she was a lot like a televangelist herself. Of course, she, she did her evangelism in the days before television, so she traveled. She traveled all over Europe uh, preaching her, her message. And the story goes that on one journey, she and her entourage had been set, had been beset by uh, obstacle after obstacle, and it ended with her being tossed from a carriage where she landed in the mud, and she is purported to, sitting there in the mud in her habit, she's purported to have said, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, it is no wonder that you've got so few of them. So do Christians lead charmed lives? D does everything go our way? Are, are we wealthy and healthy and immune to the troubles of this world? Not by a long shot, we're not. And I wonder why that is. Maybe, maybe, we, we have to ask ourselves, maybe it's because we're not very good Christians. Do you think? I mean, Pastor Osteen lives in a house the size of the mall. He uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. And it is absolutely true, I really do have to ask myself if maybe he could be a better Christian than I am. It is true that I struggle every single day with sins that I've struggled with my whole entire life. I don't know Joel Osteen. It is a distinct possibility that he is 100 times the Christian that I am. But I don't know him, so that's not a good comparison. So let's continue to test it, though. Let's, let's tease this out and think about the best Christians that we know. Now, I am tempted to put some of you in that, that category. We have some very fine Christian folk in this parish. But I happen to know that none of you is perfect. So who would I say that the best Christians are, or maybe the best Christians were? And I think it'd probably be safe to say that the best Christians that we know of off the top of our heads would be those people that Jesus made the first bishops of our church, Peter and Andrew and James and John. We know them as well as anyone can today. They were not perfect, but they were the best that we know of. They surely weren't rich. And if we ask ourselves if they led a safe, warm, comfortable life, well, just remind yourself how it ended for all of them. The happiest ending was probably the end of John's life, and he wasted away in a prison. The rest of them were tortured to death. So the best Christians that we know of were not promised safety or comfort or immunity. Far from it. So following God, we can assume, is not something we do because of how it makes us feel. It's not something that we do because it makes us feel good. It offers us absolutely nothing material. And as this world continues to turn, it will probably make us fit in less and less as we go. And it's always been that way. Now, the Old Testament lesson this morning is one of the greatest stories in the Hebrew part of the Bible 
the little boy, young, young boy, the little boy Samuel is called to become the prophet Samuel. Probably one of the big three, maybe behind uh, Moses and Elijah, Pro- probably. Now, if you want to talk about no guarantee of happiness, then read about the lives of the prophets. Nobody liked the prophets, not a one. They were harsh and they were blunt and they were weird. Some of them were extremely weird. Samuel was young, and when I say young, I mean like he could have been as young as eight or nine. He was a little boy, and he was being raised by a man he adored, the prophet, uh, the, the priest, Eli. Eli was his priest and his mentor and his role model. And one night, Samuel hears the word of the Lord, the voice of God, and Eli tells him to answer him if he hears it again. And Samuel does just that. So God then tells Samuel that he has to deliver a message to Eli, the man that he adores like his own father. And it is not good news at all, not even close. Eli's sons are the worst. They're irreverent and blasphemous. And Eli has done nothing to to rein them in. And God is about to pour out his wrath on them and on all of Eli's family. They're going to be wiped from the face of the earth. And it's that little boy's job to go back to Eli and tell him that. Now, who would want that job? And that's all the prophets ever get to do. They don't ever get to deliver the good news. Well, that's not true. Some of them do. But more often than not, it is bad news. The prophets were often not believed. They were hated or shunned or beaten. Now, were they followers of God? Absolutely. Better Jews than anybody. Did they live wealthy, comfortable, happy lives? Not even close. So, we have to look around and we have to say, what is wrong with the world lately? I I never thought that I would live through what we have seen in the last year. Yeah, I would have told you, I would have gone down swinging. There is just no way that a virus is ever gonna run out of control like the Spanish flu did. We are so far beyond that. We are evolved. Uh, We live in a world where modern medicine will knock that out in, in no time flat. Civil unrest? Never going to happen here. Couldn't, could not possibly happen in this country. There's, there's absolutely no way. We were perfectly fine, and we were perfectly happy, and then the bottom falls out. But were we? Were we ever perfectly fine, and were we ever perfectly happy? Think about the last hundred years or so. There were a lot of Christians who lived in this world a hundred years ago, and we still had World War I and the Spanish flu, and the stock market crash, and a depression so bad that the unemployment rose to over 25%, and the median family income dropped by more than 40%, and then we had World War II, and then we had polio, and then we had Vietnam, and then we had race riots, and I promise that all of you could just continue naming all the things that I've left out. And even if you were not affected by one of these things, you can still ask yourself, has there really ever been a time in my life where I was completely at peace, completely content, and completely happy? And my guess is that you probably haven't, not completely. And there's a reason. And the, world, and the, and the reason is that this world is not quite right. It, it has fallen and we are fallen, and we're anxious and discontent, and we will be as long as we're in this world. So why are we Christians if it doesn't make us feel good? And why are we Christians if it does not make us happy? And why are we Christians if it doesn't get us good stuff? Well, we're Christians because we were not made for those things in this world. We were made to have all of that, but we were made for the world to come. And Christ is calling us back to that world with every breath we take. He wants to be with us, and the reason that we're Christians is because we want to be with him too. We long for contentment 
and peace and happiness. And we will only find that in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't listen to the world. It only takes you looking around to see that there's nothing in this world that will fill that Jesus-sized hole in your heart. And if we live for God, he will live in us. And that's the only peace and the only contentment that we will find. And that's a cheery little upbeat message, isn't it? That, that, you're all going to leave feeling good, right? Because, you know, I love to make people feel good. But the contentment that we will find, we store up in our hearts, and, and, and it will be unleashed in the world to come. St. Augustine prayed a little prayer that I'll leave you with. St. Augustine was a great saint. And he, short little pithy prayers, and he prayed, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our heart will find no rest until it rests in thee. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We especially pray for presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Bishop John Bauer Schmidt, the Anglican Church of Australia, the Church of the Holy Trinity, Nashville, and the 189th Convention of the Diocese of Tennessee. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We especially pray for Donald, our president, Joe, our president-elect, Bill, our governor, and those in the service of our country, Danny, Jacob, Douglas, Jeffrey, Stephen, Cameron, Jack, John, and Kurt. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to honor and your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely, closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We especially pray for those celebrating the anniversary of their birth, Ashley Carr, Ava Faulknesson, and Elliot Johnson and for those celebrating the anniversary of their marriage. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We especially pray for Angela, Christy and Joe, Evan, Tony, Charles and Louise, Linda, Sheila, Honey, Patrick, Peggy, Jeff, Richard, Bruce, Jean, Patty, George, Diane, Mary, and Elliot. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy Sam and all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you unto everlasting life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Just, uh, just a few this, this morning. Uh, our Wednesday night Bible study will resume this uh, coming Wednesday. That's uh, adults and youth will begin at 6.30. There's still no meal, but I am very hopeful that uh, we can get some vaccines and some arms soon and get back to that as soon as possible. Uh, and Miss Elizabeth, you do catechesis of the Good Shepherd at 6.30. Is that right? Okay. And the office, the church office, will be closed tomorrow in observance of Martin Luther King Day. The convention of the Diocese of Tennessee is this Saturday. Uh, it will all be online, so let me know if you want to link to that. I am sure you are all just chomping at the Paul, right? Uh, how, is this maybe the first one you haven't been to in like 20 years, Paul? Um, it, it's like watching uh, paint dry, and I am sure that you would like to join me in watching that paint dry. So if you want a link to the convention, just let me know. I will hook you right up. Confirmation classes are beginning soon for, uh, for everyone who needs to be confirmed or if you uh, need to become a member of the Episcopal Church and be received by the bishop. He will be here on Pentecost Sunday, which is May 23rd. I hope very much that we'll be able to have that outside under the pavilion uh, like, we, like we did for years and years. It's early enough. It shouldn't be too terribly hot. So pray that the weather co uh, cooperates with us. And uh, good deacon, how did Room in the Inn go last night? Room in the Inn went really well last night because um, we only had seven fellows and we had very few people who were there. We've We've had to pull back a lot because uh, we want to make everybody safe and healthy. And that is so foreign to us. But we had to do that last night. In fact, I left right after helping them serve. Uh, so there would be fewer people there also. But it went very well. There was one man who was in a wheelchair. If you can imagine being homeless and being in a wheelchair. Um, 
that sort of thing has happened in the past and we're very conscious of making them feel com comfortable. We have to stack the mats up a little bit higher so they can get down easier. A lot of the fellows are older and their joints hurt, but I'm told that it was a really, really good meeting last night. And I wanna thank the youth uh, for their participation. I don't know if you know this or not, but two of our youth members come every time before anyone gets here and they set up the beds for them and they set up gift bags for them and then they leave in order to make everyone safe. And I wanna thank them. It was Andrew and Patrick last night. One other message is that uh, Thursday after next, which is the 28th, we'll begin our study on Romans. So watch the e-bulletin for that and there'll be a link for that. Some of it is on Zoom and some of it is um, just homework to do on your own. So I hope you'll join us. Deacon Susie, about a week or a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, uh, I was headed to the hospital to Vandy early, early, early uh, one morning. It was about 5 or 5.30 that morning, and it was snowing like crazy, and it had been snowing. And right about the time I got to Vanderbilt, I passed a man who clearly lived right there close to that intersection. And he had on a, a nice warm wool hat, and he had on a big heavy coat and gloves and a pair of shorts, because that's all he had. He didn't, he didn't have anything else. Uh, and I, uh, I, I certainly hope that somebody opened their doors for him to spend the night. Uh, I, always, I always think of that when I pass somebody who's having a tough time on the street. But I, I, hope, churches are, uh, I hope churches are opening up their doors uh, for those folks. So thank you all for doing that. And thank you, Good Deacon, for, um, for spearheading that. Are there any birthdays in, in church today? I know, it's Miss Ava. Come on down, Miss Ava. How old, Ava? Twelve. Watch over Miss Ava, Almighty God, as her days increase and bless her. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, if you were Jewish, you'd be an adult today. Did you know that? <laughs> be an adult. Mazel tov, that's right. That's right. How, how about any, uh, any anniversaries today? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice unto God.
and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you, In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, We remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our our, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him in the unity of the holy spirit all honor and glory is yours almighty father now and forever amen and now as our savior christ has taught us we are bold to say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen.